Hello, women made in the image of God. Today we are back with day five and um, yeah, of Bible in the year. So let's go ahead and pray and get into it so that I don't make this video as long as the last video was. Um, but I still think and hope it was helpful to the last video. Um, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to gather together um, on YouTube to read your word um, and to learn more about you, to grow in love for you. Um, blessed Lord, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, um, for our instruction, and for our encouragement, um, please grant that we may hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest your word. Um, that through the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our dear and precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So, today we are on chapter... Uh, chapters 12 through 14 of Genesis and Matthew chapter 6. So we will continue um, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, which will be awesome. And so will Genesis 12 through 14, because all scripture is God-breathed. All right. So grab your highlighters, grab your paper Bibles. Uh, I have to refresh this page, apparently. Okay, so Genesis 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 70, 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, as his, took, took Sarai his wife and Lot's brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going going toward Negev. I'm going to read the note on uh, from the Reformation Study Bible. On uh, Also, I still haven't figured out how to scroll through all of them uh, at once, so I should figure that out. <laughs> uh, so it will be helpful for you. Um, I, I do like the ESV Study Bible. Again, I'll scroll through them as well later uh, but I really do enjoy the Reformation Study Bible um, so I'm going to read this note so those these are based this notes based on all the verses that we just read so it says Abram's call as an agent of redemptive gr redemptive grace parallels Noah's Noah's as the mediator of a covenant to all creation the form of God's call to Abraham also resembles his pattern in creation announcement, command, and report, but the pattern is broken by the divine promise, highlighting Abraham's faith and believing obedience. I also really like this language because it reminds me of Hebrews, um, and I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So Hebrews 9 verse 15 says, sorry, I'm still sick, so 
Um, yeah. Okay, so Hebrews 9, verse 15. Therefore, um, actually, I'm going to back up to verse 14. The reading from the ESV says, uh, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Also notice how Trinitarian this passage is. Um, God is triune. And again, refer to the links I shared in the last video for more to just continue to grow an understanding of that. Um, yeah, so important who God is. Um, there's so many cults that uh, will um, try to say otherwise as well. Um, you know, like Jehovah's Witnesses is a cult. Uh, Mormons is a cult. Uh, but God can save anyone, and he saved many people out of those movements. Um, thanks be to God. But yeah, those are not Christian movements, just in case someone tries to show, tell you otherwise. Um, but anyways, let's keep reading, and then we'll get back to our text. So, So we just read this part purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he, speaking of Christ, is the new mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Hebrews is just all around just a great book. Um, but yeah, all, all everything in scripture points to Christ so I just thought that was really cool how even that this paragraph shows this whole thing this shows us um, points to Jesus who was going to be the mediator of the new covenant um, in which Abraham was also saved by faith um, through Christ who is to come the Messiah who is to come Genesis 3:15 we see it as early as there um, you know the gospel. Okay, so verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to, to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman, beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. <laughs> Anyways, uh, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Okay, wait, let me actually see if there's a note on this. Hold on. I'm scrolling down. So if you want these notes, go ahead and pause it. Read those. Um, go to pause. Okay, well, actually, I actually don't have to pause yet, but okay. I guess I'll read this when we're done reading this part. Okay. Uh, say you're my sister may go well because you. Uh, when Abram entered, verse fourteen. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was be was very beautiful, and when the pre princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants. Um, yeah, and for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called to Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? What well, now then here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. They sent him away with this, with his wife and all that he had. Okay. So the note says the matriarch Sarah is also endangered in chapter 20. Um, so that's later. It says, Abraham exodus from Egypt prefigures the nation's later exodus. God sends a famine. Um, the Egyptians afflict them. God sends plagues on the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians let them go with great wealth. They had to return to the stages through the wilderness. And finally, back in the land, they worshiped the Lord. 
Uh, that wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but um, Egyptians, dot, 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 they will kill me. Although hospitality to strangers was a duty in the near in the ancient Near East, strangers remained vulnerable. Abraham was not necessarily necessarily selling Sarah's honor to save himself, since this ruse was planned long before, uh, be, perhaps to stall for time and dangerous circumstances. His actions, however, reject reflect his failure at this point to trust God fully. Yep. Yeah, there's not. Okay. Anyways. Um yeah, so that that was what I wanted to get at. His actions um here show his failure to trust God uh fully at this point that he would put her basically in harm's way. Um you know, it I mean, they say in the note it wasn't necessarily to save himself, but I I mean, I feel like it's kind of really clearly in the text i mean you say here what did he said he said uh um they will kill you they they will kill me but they will let you live so he says say you are my sister that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake well i guess for your sake um you'd have to read it in the greek to really break it down but Honestly, I don't know. It seems very self-preserving when he is supposed to be. I mean, we see Christ being willing to lay down his life. Um, uh, and that's the kind of love that husbands are called to. If you look at Ephesians 5. I'll just look over there really quickly. Um, right here. So Ephesians 5.25 um, starting in verse 25 says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives, wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Um, yeah, I really, I, I want to read the whole thing, but if you want to just go ahead and pause and read it, but the, the whole point I was making was this, um, that, uh, even though Abram put, <laughs> kind of fails in this, this point, you know, I mean, there's so many wonderful things that God does through Abram. Uh, this is one of the, his weak points though. Um, he's a human just like all of us in need of a savior. Uh, that being Jesus, Jesus being the one who perfectly uh, loves the church as husbands are, are called to love their wives, um, though you see them falling short at times on this earth. Um, yeah, so thank God for God. Thank God for Jesus. So let's continue on. I think I um, exhausted that passage. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so fa and, uh, verse 20, just to tie that up. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So, chapter 13. Mm, so go ahead and read those notes if you want them. Um, let me grab you the notes from this from the uh esv so go ahead and pause and pause and read that you can pause and read that check that map out very cool pause and read pause and read pause and read Pause and read. Yep, and that brings us to chapter 13. All right. Cool. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm like scrolling. I got, I got lost my tab. There we are. 
All right, chapter 13, verse 1. So coming right off of that story, or that uh, historical account. Um, chapter 13, verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the Negeb. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negeb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord, and Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's, Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and Perizzites were dwelling in the land. It's <laughs> funny. Uh, the, the note says possessions were so great. Paradoxically, God's blessing, not uh, famine, provokes the problem. And it uh, give, it quotes a note from a different passage. Uh, humanity's environment is not the cause of sin. Oh, that's a good note right there. Um, humanity's environment is not the cause of sin. Human depravity is. In the, in the ideal environment of Eden, sin originated. And sin now abounds in the rich territory that Lot chooses. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So. Where were we? I'm sorry about that. I got distracted. I guess it was a good kind of distraction. <laughs> Let's start from verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. For we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take if you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, and the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> this looks like foreshadowing right there. Big dot dot dot. So Lot chose for himself at all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring... Sorry, I was just noticing that the Lord was speaking specifically to Abram and not Lot. Um... Anyways, nor northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you will see, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring f and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if no one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can be also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Okay, so if you want these notes, go ahead and read that. Or pause and read. And then, yeah, that, that's it. Okay, so then pause and read that if you want that. And then I'm going to go to the ESV Study Bible, so go ahead and pause and read that if you want that. And pause and read that if you want that. Mm 
Okay, and then, yeah, then that's it for that chapter. Alright, so Genesis 14. Here we are. So coming out of that. So let's reread four, eight, uh, verse 18 of the previous chapter, to, uh, and then we'll go into 14. So, so Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of El Elisar, Shadonar, or Shadon La Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Golim. These kings made war with Barah, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shem. Shem Shemabar, king of Zeoboam, and the king of Bala, that is Zoar, and all these joined forces in the valley of. Sorry, it's late at night. I need to wake up. Uh, so verse three, and all these uh, joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the sea salt. Twelve years they had served Chedor. Chedorlaomer. I actually want to know how to like pronounce this. It'd be so cool if there was like a reading read out loud button. I know I have I have the audio Bible. I'm gonna I'm gonna let's see let's see guys can you learn how to read this? A <laughs> hey, here we go. The following is a presentation of Got Questions Ministries. Who was Ketoliomer? Ketoliomer was a king who was a contemporary. Ketoliomer. Ketoliomer. Okay. What a. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, okay. Twelve years they had served Ketoliomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Ketoliomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim. In Ashtaroth Karnam, the Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in Shiva Kiriathayim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites, who were dwelling in Hazazon, Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zo Zeoboam, and the king of Bala, that is Zoar, went out, and they jo joined battle in the valley of Sidim. Then Chedolimer, um, Chedol Dang, I forgot. And I get I think that's it. Then Chedolimer, um, king of Elam, title king of Goim, Emaphrael, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elis Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped and came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol, and of Enner. These were allies. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsman had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, three hundred and eighteen of them, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his force against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Ho Hobah north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. That's so cool. Um, 
Um, seeing if there's anything I want to read out loud. Um, yeah, let's read this one. So, uh, that verse 1 through 24. You know what? We got to keep reading to get that one. So, let's see. So, verse 17. After his return from the deed of defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Amen. And Abram, um, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal of strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let em, let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. That's so cool. <laughs> also, I like this of how it teaches us, uh, and shows us, you know, God. God is the Most High, and He's the possessor, the owner, uh, the ruler of heaven and earth. Um, and God is awesome. He delivers us. Um, he delivers who he delivers. Mercy on whom he has mercy. But yeah, um, God is so awesome. And the way that he works through Abram is really cool too. Um, yeah, anyways. Um, yeah, now we can read that note. So, um, four fourteen. I also really want to nerd out about this whole Melchizedek thing, um, which is brought up later. Um, and some people think maybe Melchizedek was like a shadow of Christ or like a, what is it called? There's this word. Um, it's like speculative anyways, but Melchizedek, uh, maybe got questions as a good article and I'll put it below. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll put it below. It's, yeah, people think of him as like a type of Christ um, kind of thing. A uh, Christ Christophany, that's the word I was looking for. So I'll put both these articles, um, the Theophany and the Christophany thing, because um, that'll be cool to look out for. Um, but I won't go into it just yet. Um, I will just, because I don't want this video to be too long. Um, but just know that it's cool. It's definitely worth t your time. And also the cool thing about Got Questions articles is if you're an audio listener like me, you can r listen to the audio so reading the article to you while you're, you can also have it in front of you. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, let's go ahead and read that note. It says, Abraham dis uh, displays obedient faith by risking... Sorry. Um, obedient faith by risking his life to deliver his nephew Lot. His victory is astonishing since the plundering confederacy of five kings had just conquered many Canaanites and a confederacy of five dead, dead sea kings. Um, yeah. God is more powerful than anything. So that's it for um, Genesis for today. Um, we're going to scroll through the notes and then we'll move on to Matthew chapter 6. Okay. So pause and read that if you want that. Pause and check out that map if you want that. I wonder if I can... No, I can't. Okay. Um, anyways, and then pause and read that if you want that. Oh, I'm going to read this note. Oh, actually, I want to read this note. Um, 
God Most High. Similar titles are used of God in the Genesis narrative, El Olam, Everlasting God. Uh, the patriarchs use these titles for the Lord, the true God, creator of heaven and earth. Abraham interprets Melchizedek's praise in this way, repeating the same titles but adding the covenantal divine name, Lord, Yahweh. In verse 22, um, though probably a Canaanite, Melchizedek, Melchizedek uh, knows the true God. Uh, a pagan priest cannot meaningly bless Abraham, nor can Abraham, who is consecrating the land to the Lord, give a tithe to the priest of the uh, depraved Canaanite god El. Uh, El. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go up here. Uh, blessed him. The Melchizedek that Melchizedek blesses Abraham is understood by the author of Hebrews to indicate that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. You can go ahead and pause and read that if you want to read that. It's an awesome passage. Um, yeah, I really want to read it out loud to y'all. <laughs> But, um, yeah, okay, so, um, verse 23, this is uh, referring to when Abram was like, I'm not going to take your stuff, king of Sodom, um, I would not take yours. In contrast to his dealings with Melchizedek, from whom he accepted bread and wine, and to whom he gave a tithe, Abraham wants nothing to do with the wicked king of Sodom. Abraham rejects the use of military force in order to take control of the land of Canaan. He will wait for God to give it to him. Amen. Okay, so now we're going to Matthew chapter 6. So remember, we are in the, what is called, the Sermon on the Mount. So this is Jesus speaking remember all of god's word is god breathed so technically everything should be in red because it's all god but anyways <laughs> that's why it's red uh matthew 6 starting in verse 1 Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand do what, know what your right hand is doing. So that, I'm going to read that over because I... I messed it up anyways it says but when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you um i also just want to pause this uh i wanted to talk about it but i'm also going to just read the notes it says your righteousness Jesus affirms the positive value of such acts, but only when done in submission to God and love for him rather than for human personal glory. Acts of piety, for example, generosity, prayer, and fasting, performed for the sake of public recognition, are self-serving and do not show love for God or neighbor. Hypocrites. In the New Testament, the hypocrite is one who claims to have a relationship with God and to love righteousness but is self-seeking, self-reliant, and even self-deceived. In chapter 23, Jesus will expose the inconsistencies of Israel's religious leaders whose deeds contradict their words. Okay, so I'm actually going to, I just want to talk about this too for a second. Um, so if you are going out um, and you're, you know, giving to those in need, and then you go and you brag about it, like, ten minutes later to, like, every person you know, <laughs> what the, what, what is the point of that? Like, you, you're, then you're just glorifying yourself, um, and so 
if you're sitting there and you're like hey homeless person here's a piece of food and you're like on tiktok or whatever it is like that's not honoring to god um and when you see people doing that kind of thing it's just it just exposes our own it just exposes our depravity um don't do things to be seen by others um do it for jesus do it in jesus um in christ uh for christ uh by christ and uh yeah that's just my encouragement to you um based off of the text um yeah listen to what jesus said um i'm gonna move on but i also want to say just before we even get to the fasting part um, the same thing should apply when, uh, same principle should apply when you're fasting. I, I just, the text is so clear. Um, you're not supposed to go around being like, oh, sorry, I can't eat because I'm fasting. Oh, sorry, I can't eat because I'm fasting. Oh, yeah, I'm fasting. Did you know that I'm fasting? With the, what's the point of doing that? Um, like, Jesus says directly not to do that. Like, it's, it's not supposed to be like, oh, I'm so holy, I'm fasting. It's like, you know, um, yeah, it's supposed to be between you and God, um, so I'll just let the text speak for itself, but I just wanted to say that, okay, um, um, it's also like, we can't fool God, God knows what's happening in our heart, um, and so if we do these things out of a self-seeking, uh, self-glorifying, posture god knows that god knows what's going on he's not dumb um he's literally omnipresent and omniscient and omnipotent um in other words he knows all things he is over all things okay so matthew 6 starting in verse 5 and when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others truly i say to you they receive their reward when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I um, also want to say, if you haven't memorized this, I totally recommend it. I totally recommend just, even just maybe just using it as a, not even maybe, use it as a guide for prayer. Um, it, he says, pray like this. It's good to, to literally pray this, but it's also good to use it as a guide when you're praying. Um, like the first part is like, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So remembering how holy God is, like, god you're so holy you're so awesome like there's literally no one like you there's no rock like you and like just praising him for who he is um and how like absolutely perfect and other he is um yeah and then uh you could even think about the gospel as you're praying that as well but um you know your kingdom come your will be done so praying for god's will to be done in your life and in the lives of others and in general um you know, and praying that his kingdom would come, um, on earth as it is in heaven, um, and then praying that, uh, you know, then bringing your requests before God, give to us this day our daily bread, and also acknowledging, like, Jesus himself said, uh, man should not live by bread alone, but by, uh, every word, uh, from the mouth of God, so also just thanking him for, like, giving him access to the word of God, um, I mean, that's something I like to do, when I think about this, um, but yeah, you know, bringing requests before him and stuff, and thanking him, um, and, uh, forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors, so praying, um, prayers of repentance, and praying, uh, 
uh, prayers of asking God for forgiveness and asking him for help and for strength to forgive those who have sinned against you because it is it is hard. <laughs> um, and I, I would even say in that praying for those that you know uh, don't know Jesus, praying for their salvation because ultimately um, they need to be reconciled back to God uh, if they're not in Christ. Um, and so if it's Lord's will that, that God would save them. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, then the last part and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, so yeah, praying that is really important. Uh, praying for strength to not sin, um, praying for protection from temptation and deliverance from temptation um, and deliverance from evil, uh, protection from evil, very key, and then uh, obviously asking God for help with that, with this line, um, okay, now we're gonna move on, um, if you guys want to pause and read those notes, totally recommend checking that out, it goes more into dip in depth to these parts, um, yeah, okay, uh, so Matthew 6 verse 16 and when you fast do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others truly I say to you they have received their reward but when you fast anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you And uh, this part where it says, anoint your head and wash your face, this is talking about um, so that, like, you look awake and alive. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to actually use oil. I mean, I guess you, you could, um, but, I mean, don't take my word for it. Obviously, do your own research. But it the, the thought is that you would look awake, like, that it's not like you're walking around like, oh, like, oh, I'm so tired because I'm fasting because I'm so holy. You know, it's like, <laughs> no. Anyways, let me stop making so many notes and just read the text to you. Okay. Verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Very important line here. Very important. All of it is important, but yeah, I just love that. So, so key. The eye of the lamp is the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So important. Um, I'm going to read the, the uh, note on here. It says, uh, light in you. The, um, the good eye... Look, so this is on a uh, note on verse 23 here. The good eye looks to God as its master and fills the person with the light of God's will. The bad eye looks to treasures on earth and admits only the darkness of greed and self-interest. That the person's whole life will be determined by the kind of light the eye lets in. Wow. Up. Oh. Um, oh yeah you know I should have just read this um, note on the anoint your head thing I'm going to read it now it says anoint your head this symbolized rejoicing but it was also part of the first century Jews daily routine when fasting not to anoint oneself would advertise one's self denial to a human audience interesting Okay. I don't know if that helped you guys at all, but <laughs> maybe we should look at the ESV one as well. 
uh, the study Bible notes. Mm -mm. Oh yeah, if you want the notes before that, go ahead and read. Go ahead and read those, and then go ahead and read those. Go ahead and read those. Okay, it says uh, various kinds of fasting. Anointing and washing signify preparations to enjoy life. Okay. Okay. Well, I encourage you to do more research on that. Read the verses that they gave here. And the previous one as well. Um... So, without further ado, verse 25, this is a beautiful passage, it says, so after I'm um, talking about, I'm going to back up to verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O, le o you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. S yep, so good. Okay. Mm, 625 anxious about your life anxiety over the uncertainty or scarcity of resources to sustain physical life reveals a faltering faith in the father's care for his children confident prayer with thanks is the antidote oh definitely i'm going to read philippians 4 6 and 7 uh philippians 4 uh verses 6 and 7 so verse 6 says do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, feel free to read that note as well. I'm going to read the 633 one, so Matthew 633. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We are to make God's redemptive rule, um, 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven as at hand. <clears throat> And a right relationship with him. The highest priorities in life. Worry is inconsistent with this priority. It doubt, Its doubts distract from these supreme goals. God will meet all the needs of those who risk all, risk all for him. Amen. Uh, I'm going to read the note and the verse that they're also pointing out here. So, uh, I think it's from Matthew 3 verse 15. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus is it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And then the note for that uh, righteousness, I think we read this um, when we read Matthew 3. 
says God's kingdom, his sovereign rule and salvation and judgment is defined by his righteousness. Jesus teaches the perfect righteousness that God requires. He also secures God's righteousness for sinners. Amen. His baptism points to his death as a ransom for many and shows the perfect obedience in which he fulfills all righteousness. Remission of sins and the gift of righteousness are received through faith in Jesus. Those who lack God's righteousness but hunger and thirst for it will be filled. Jesus calls those burdened with the load of self-righteousness to find their rest in him. Amen. Christ is our only hope for righteousness being accepted before the father that's why the father sent the son yep and that's why jesus laid down his life for us so that we could have his righteousness as our own he who knew no sin um second corinthians 5 21 for our sake Sorry, here we go. Where, where'd you go, ESV? Oh, it's at the top. Probably. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. All right, y'all. So that's it for today. Um, wow, today was a long video too. Sorry, Matthew 6 is just too important. I mean, all of scripture is important, but um, yeah. I'll put some helpful links in the bio if you want those. So um, God bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and give you peace. This is the word of the Lord. And you would say, thanks be to God. <laughs>